Hi, review time today. A few years ago I was looking around for a portable handheld scope for um, working on site. I do a lot of um, things like lighting installations, crazy art projects, UFOs, strange things that need on-site debugging, quite often things like DMX data um, for lighting control, checking power and so on. Um, I looked quite, um, took quite a hard look at what was on the market in terms of small scopes. There was the Fluke scope meters, which were nice but very expensive. Agilent had quite a nice one, um, but it was a bit big and chunky, and there's a few features it didn't have. For example, there's no trigger hold off on it, uh, which I would expect on a uh, scope for the price. And I ended up with this. This is the Owen um, HDS 2062M, um, which is a scope. Uh, with a multimeter, the multimeters, we'll go into that later, it's not, not great, you'd want to take a fluke along with you as well. Um, but this was about the best in terms of a decent spec scope, it's a 60 meg two channel scope in a nice sort of small handheld package, fairly decent battery life, quite nice display and quite nice uh, screen response. A um, few things I don't like about this, um, one is the multimeter doesn't have high current range, they actually give you this separate external plug-in current shunt, which is yet another thing that you need to um, plug in. But the biggest pain with this is the user interface. What they've done is these, these four arrow buttons on the select do all your X and Y functions and a few others, things like cursor. So you basically have to step through the functions on the button between time, time base, um, vertical position, vertical sensitivity, and in some of the other modes it's things like trigger level, cursor positions as, as well. So they basically put too much on too few buttons, so it's, re it's a real fiddle to use. Um, for various reasons I've been using this quite a lot more recently. Um, and notice that I want to have actually produced a new range. This is the model numbers on this are the same, but they've got a dash n suffix, and they've also now got a hundred meg version. They do a twenty, a sixty, and a hundred meg version now. I think they also do a twenty meg single channel one, which I mean single channel scope for a bit of a waste of time. Um, the obvious changes are you've now got these dedicated Y uh, buttons. Uh, there's a single button alternates between shift and um, sensitivity, which is reasonable. You've only got two, two choices, so you're not cycling around all, all the selections as you were before uh, on the other model. Um, and also, the, they 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 use the these arrow these arrow buttons a lot more carefully most of the time. The left and right are either time based or, or shift, so that's a lot better. Also, it's got sort of rubber buttons, which are fairly tactile. I, one thing I didn't like on this, although it's got the the, button, the clicky buttons are a little bit too hard. Um, they're just just a little bit annoying, I found. So, um, so I picked this one up, this is the 100 meg version, just to see if it was any better. Um, the obvious thing is it's now got a 10 amp um, current range and they don't bother putting the... Uh, here they've got this silly little component test thing, which isn't all that useful. I find it's not the sort of thing you need to use. Yeah, component testing is something you do on the bench. Um, when you're out on the field, you know, you're testing things, you're sticking probing, probes, probes into things. So having the 10 amp there is probably going to be a bit more, more useful. Um, immediate obvious difference is this has now got a lead backlight. This 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 one, um, the backlight's a little bit dim, but when I first got it, it was a little bit flickery, so it might be this this one might have had a slight fault on it. Um, but it, you can actually use it without the backlight. That's with the backlight off. So if you're out in, in sunny conditions, it actually is quite usable without the backlight at all. And the backlight, although it's not very bright, it's bright enough for situations where you can't see it without the backlight. This one's got a, a LED backlight, which is much brighter. I mean, it's just insanely bright at its top setting. But again, still, you can use it with no backlight. Um, so that, 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 that's an obvious improvement. Right, both scopes are packaged in this case. It's sort of solid case. Obviously, you get the scope, um, lens lead. There's a fairly chunky power supply. Um, it's a bit on the big side, it's 9 volts at uh, 3 amps, but the battery life on this is good, it's about 5 hour battery life, so you can quite happily charge it before you go out and not worry too much about taking the charger with you. Um, you get some probes, the probes are actually not bad, I quite like these. They're fairly standard, they're switchable times 1 times 10. Now, you don't often need times 1, I think my only criticism is it's too easy to accidentally switch the times 1 times 10, but apart from that they're Pretty reasonable scope probe, they've got a spring hook. Um, no particular reason to change them for anything else, they're quite happy with that. The other thing you get with this, you get the little plug-in component test socket, which again, you're probably not, not really going to use. All the usual like recolouring accessories for the scope probes. And of course you get the, for the um, this locking case, you get these super high security keys. You can see the uh, high security profile on that. The other thing you get is this. Um, there's, there's a few various. It's got a USB interface. You can connect it up to a PC. You can also connect a USB memory stick to, to save waveforms. But the stupid, stupid thing is, although they've actually got quite a lot of space, they've used a mini USB connector for it, and they give you this little lead. So to save stuff to a memory stick, you need to plug this lead in and plug your memory stick into the 
into the lead, which is just daft. There's plenty of room in there for a proper USB thing. I think the issue is they, they use the same case moulding as this. Um, the other thing which shows they, they basically wanted to not, not change the case moulding is this socket on the side. One limitation of the old one is they didn't have a, uh, a probe calibration um, output. Now on this one, what they do is there's a little socket on the side into which you plug this, and these are your scope, cal scope calibration thing. Now, that's just stupid. You know, to carry this thing just for calibrating your probe, all you need is a little hole that you can poke a scope probe into. Daft. Stupid. It also comes with these test leads, pretty bog standard leads, no clips or anything, just standard leads. They claim to be Cat 4 600 volts, 20 amps, but not sure I'd really trust that. Right, now you might be thinking, oh, it comes with a nice case, isn't this great? No, it's stupid. If you want a small, buying a small scope, you buy it because it's small. You're never going to go on site with just a scope. You're going to have your tools, your multimeter, your laptop, whatever. So what you don't want is a massive great case that's actually bigger than a Rigol desktop scope. Absolutely ridiculous. What you want is something like this. This is actually um, a, a zip-up soft case for a portable hard disk. You've got enough space for the meter, the power supply, probes. You've got a separate zip-up piece for all the little bits that you don't want to lose when you open the case. That's what you want. Not this. This is just stupid. If you come onto a job site taking on your nice little case, you're just going to look like a dick. You want something like this, protects the scope, throw it in your toolbox, job done. Right, what do we need for this job? Da -da -da -da. PCB drill, PCB trimming tool, fine adjustment tool, soldering iron, uh, hot air rework. And scope. Sorted. Let's take a look around the outside of this thing. Um, here we've got the BNCs. Um, what I don't like is they're using these plastic insulated BNCs. Um, I think the idea is that if, say, you've got one plug, pr probe plugged in and the, um, the ground's live, you, know, you don't want them an exposed metal one that you might touch, but to be honest, I think I'd prefer a metal one just because it's stronger. Uh, the, these pegs are going to wear out in time. don't particularly like those. Um, the top here, behind this rubber, we've got... Um, this is USB host, uh, as we saw last time with that, um, that stupid lead. They should have put a proper USB-A socket on there. Um, this is the USB device socket, non-standard connector. Again, they should have used the mini USB connector so you could use a standard mini USB lead and not have to carry a special one. Here we've got RS-232. Now, why on earth do they bother putting RS-232 on here? I really can't imagine why you'd ever want RS-232 um, with, you know, everything's USB these days. I just don't see why they, they even bother. It's probably just a, a relic from the previous design. Again, identical connectors, and they've also used the same connector for this um, silly probe compensation thing. Um, around the back we've got this tilt stand which sort of it's, it feels a bit flimsy but it sort of holds it fairly solidly you know it's not it doesn't fall over when you press the buttons um, there's two two tilt positions it gets a little bit squishy when it's on that that thing you'll notice that the screen's quite reflective um, seems to be a trend on pretty much everything laptops and everything to have a shiny screen rather than an anti reflective one which seems a bit, a bit silly um, it's got this sort of orange rubber but I like the orange better than the uh, blue makes it easy to see and I think it looks nicer um, but it's a, it's actually got these vents so this case is not in any way sealed it's actually got air vents top and bottom now I really can't see it doesn't seem to get hot enough to justify that so I don't quite understand that and you know I've had to use a scope in light rain before and obviously this offers no um, environmental protection I think I may end up just putting some tape over that um, yeah, unless maybe I'll have to check how hot it gets when charging but in normal operation you know it certainly doesn't get hot enough to justify having um, slots there Right, let's look at the basic controls. Here we've got the on-off switch. It's a clicky push-on, push-off type switch. Start-up time, about five seconds. Not too bad. One slightly silly thing, though, is this. Press any key to continue. Well, why? What vital information is there here for me to need to read it before I press the key? But if you ignore that, it's about five seconds, so it's quick enough that you can... Don't worry about turning it off to save battery. Um, I mean, I'm not using it for a little while. Right, let's take a look at the screen layout and everything. It's got a really nice super fast update rate, which is absolutely what you really, really want, especially on a handheld um, scope. There's just no lag at all. It's very, very nicely responsive. Um, that's certainly better than a lot of the other smaller scopes I've seen. 
it's you know, everything's pretty much instantaneous so that's one thing they, they really have got right um, just quickly go through the screen layout you've got um, battery indicator not really sure how accurate that is there's two measurements and each of these measurements you can um, set a variety of different figures completely independently um, you can set which channel you can measure um, frequency period average voltage peak to peak um, RMS maximum minimum voltages um, pulse top and base um, amplitude overshoot and pre-shoot on square wave signals um, rise and fall time positive and negative pulse widths um, duty cycles um, and channel to channel delay which obviously only works if you've got two signals there so a pretty reasonable range of measurements the sort you'd see in any sort of mid-range mid scope so but the nice thing is each, each of these is completely separate so you can have any two you want on there which is quite handy you're not constrained um, in any way on that um, you've got the your basic t uh, time base setting here, trigger status, so we can run, do a run and stop, it shows you that, that mode. Um, your two input sensitivities, uh, so that's the delay and this is the uh, time based setting, so as we change our delay you'll see that changing there, as we change the time based setting that changes down here. These have both got an M in front, I think that's because when you're using it in delay time based mode that's M for main time base as opposed to the win window, they call it zoom window um, for, for the zoom function. Um, so time base you've got a window function so we're now seeing the window here in the, with the green cursors so you can set a, a place to zoom in and, uh, to and then zoom in so very much a like a delayed time base on a um, conventional scope um, so that's not a, a, yeah, a super high memory bandwidth zoom in it's, it's literally it's a time delay so if I freeze it and zoom in um, that's actually not bad the record length on this is the to be 6k points per um, channel, which is for a small scope like this is not bad. It's certainly a lot more than a full screen, a full um, screen size. Um, not sure if we can actually look, try zooming in and see what it looks like. Um, there. Yeah, you're just starting to see it pixelating there. So you've got a fairly reasonable zoom range on a capture waveform for a small scope. Basic scope controls, um, this is where the biggest improvement is over the old one. For each trace you've got um, the up and down arrows with only two functions, so you've got volts per division and shift, just by alter on alternate presses those the, those buttons. Um, minor in mind, the volts position works the wrong way around, on most scopes increase increases sensitivity, here it's the other way around, but because it's a, a button rather than a knob you get used to that easily enough. And on here we've got the um, left and right alternate between either absolute time um, or time based setting so you've only got two functions there which is fine and verti vertically you've got trigger in fact um, where's the trigger level? yeah there's the trigger level there you can see on, the, on, on there um, so everything's been separated out into fairly sort of sensible um, functions there um, also set it's got most scopes have got this it, you know, tries to find reasonable settings for, for the waveform you're um, entering, it's got, obviously got limitations. Um, it's smart enough to figure out, for example, if I connect a second input, it sees that there's inputs on both channels and scales the screen um, reasonably sensibly to cope with those. Um, the other interesting thing it's got, it, which is less common, is a dynamic continuous auto set as a scale. Um, I can see this could actually be quite handy for doing sort of test and diagnostic information. What it does, it just continuously auto scales. So if I just change the input, it just rescales it automatically without having to touch anything. So if you're just doing a lot of fault finding, probing around things, um, you can tell it whether um, to do just, just vertical, just horizontal or both, and you can tell it how many cycles you want to see each time. Um, so uh, yeah, I think for, for fault finding and sort of on-site type use, I think that's potentially quite a useful feature. Let's try poking around in auto scale mode for a few waveforms. This is a um, 33 megahertz HCMOS oscillator. It's about the sort of waveform shape I'd expect to see. Um, and so yeah, power supply waveform. Let's hope to cut the ghost rescale. Yeah, that looks plausible. And another power supply waveform. And we've got some other digital stuff. So the, the auto scale makes a sort of reasonable job. Once waveforms get a bit complicated, it doesn't really know quite what to make of it. But that's what pretty much what you'd expect. But for just quick poking around, seeing what's going on, it seems to be pretty usable actually. So 
So for example there we've got a fairly fast pulse burst and it's just showing it's a single pulse which is pretty much what you'd expect it to do if we take it out of auto set mode or just scale mode manually to see what's going on there. One thing I don't like on this scope is there's no way to tell it to use a time reference over here. It's always the centre, uh, which means that if you want to see the whole thing on screen, you have to sort of start scrolling it backwards. And the problem with that is you then start zooming in and out and you, lose, you, you tend to lose your point of reference a little bit. Um, one thing I like on the, um, the Adjunct scope I've got is you can tell it to have the reference either there, there or there, and it'll expand around that point. Um, it's a minor point and it's it's annoying that I haven't done it because it's so easy to implement. It would make make the usability quite a lot uh, a lot better. One thing I did notice: the auto set will actually automatically detect a video signal and put it into video triggering mode. Um, video mode is fairly standard. You've got the options between field sync, uh, specific field sync, um, and trigger on specific line numbers. The stability is not brilliant, but it's I think adequate for field use. Um, We've got PAL NTSC modes, all the usual stuff you get on Video Sync. Right, what else we've got? Um, copy that copies uh, data to the USB stick, either as a screen image, or you can also set it to save the raw data, which you can then um, load into their PC program to generate things like CSV files, which could be potentially useful. You've got a backlight backlight adjustment, um, six settings, including off there. Um, the other thing here we've got this switches between the DMM and scope mode. Um, all these these four buttons here are purely for the DMM, which is a bit of a waste of buttons because you know you can never use the scope and the DMM at the same time. Um, so it might be nice to maybe have dual legend in but buttons just to give it a bit more, a few more buttons to uh, reduce the number of things you need to do in menus. And you've got run stop. That's a sim the, the, the standard sort of waveform freeze. Um, and also for single shot mode, it's just your, your single tr shot trigger. Yeah, well. um, this is actually running in an alternate um, triggering mode, which basically it seems to default to on auto set. It's actually triggering on. What is it? What's going on here? Right, okay. Um, the, these signals are both coming out the same SIG gen. If I plug one of these into a different signal generator, so we've got two different waveforms. That's stable because it's actually triggering on e each trace alternately. If I put it into the more conventional trigger triggering mode, this is what you'd expect to see. Um, they're not they're not totally in sync. Um, I should be able to bring them in into sync by getting the frequency right. But say the, the alternate trigger mode, I'm not really sure how useful that is in practice. Um, but when it is in that mode, one thing you do have is separate trigger levels for each um, each channel. So if I stick it in alter alternate mode. Um, we've now got two functions on these vertical buttons. We've got trig one, which is the trigger level for that top trace, and trig two, which is the trigger level for that um, the bottom trace. So it may or may not be useful. I don't totally like the fact that auto set enables that mode by default. Um, you might you may or may not want that. But then again, auto set on multiple traces. You know, if the traces are hugely different, may may not be that useful. The other thing you've got here that the 60 and 100 megahertz versions have a hardware frequency counter built in, so you've got a six digit frequency readout here on both channels. Uh, yeah, when it's in alternate mode, it'll actually do both channels because it's measuring frequency on all, all, all each channel in turn. When it's in single trigger mode, it's just measuring the it's basically measuring the trigger frequency, uh, but it means you get a, a reasonably accurate frequency figure, which can be quite useful. For reasons I don't understand, they call the frequency counter a psimometer. The on-off for that's in a bit of a strange place, yes, psimometer. The other thing to note is the, all these functions, when you press this menu button, all these functions come up, and depending where you are, the function buttons do different things, but even when the menu's disappeared, the, um, the function buttons still pop up, so you don't need to keep turning them. If you remember, if you know which menu you're in, then um, you don't need to pop the menu up to display it. I'll just quickly run through all the menu functions. Trigger mode, we've got the usual um, video, alternate trace, um, edge trigger. I'd like to have seen a pulse width trigger. Um, that's, I do a lot of work with DMX and having a pulse width trigger makes life an awful lot easier, but um, a little bit annoying they didn't include that. Rising, falling slope, channel one or two select. Um, auto normal single shot, which is the same as any other scope. DC coupling and also high and low frequency reject. Um, and also hold off. This is the one thing that the um, previous model didn't have, uh, is, is uh, trigger hold off. Um, it's minor fiddle in that you have to, to adjust it. You have to say like increase or decrease and press that to increase or decrease it. But you can, there's a single button to zero it. 
for the it's got a lot of acceleration on the button which seems to actually work fairly well it's certainly a lot better than other attempts I've seen at doing that for each channel we've got standard setups AC DC ground coupling um, channel on off probe selection 1 to 1000 it remembers the probe selection on the power off fortunately and um, true and invert well, entirely standard stuff for scope waveform maths here which is the normal stuff channel 1 minus channel 2 plus plus channel 2 um, we've also got multiply and divide um, minor annoyance the way you actually set the sensitivity of the maths you start getting more functions appearing on the on the, these buttons so we've got another option here now so we've got volts per division on left and right which is a bit confusing in a position up down uh, it's a little bit inconsistent with the way some of the other menus work but you know you've got the feature there it's not something you use very often so it's not a huge a huge annoyance and of course we've got cursor measurements the cursors are fairly fine um, they could maybe do with being one extra pixel longer but you've got uh, voltage and time cursors tell it which source so now again we've got we're using the arrow buttons to set the two cur cursor positions we've got the up and down set one at one cursor position and left and right set the other, other cursor position um, you have to take the menu out to see everything we've got all the, the usual stuff that we see you've got the delta cursor one and cursor two positions again pretty back, bog standard stuff acquisition mode we've got standard peak detect that's where your running at a fairly low time base speed it runs the ATD at full speed and gives you the the peaks um, where that's useful is if you're detecting very short pulses uh, that are spaced quite a long way apart um, averaging mode that can do quite long averages that's quite good if you've got a really horrible noisy signal if I should take the averages down to something more sensible um, you can see it's taking a while to settle in but that's averaging so it means you can get a nice clean waveform from a uh, a signal that's got a lot of noise on it. Here's an example of where uh, peak detect is useful. Uh, this is in peak detect mode. We've got about 200 nanosecond pulse every few milliseconds. If I put it in normal mode, you hardly see anything because the sampling is not happening in the right place. At the peak detect, it sees every pulse. That's very handy for looking at um, glitches and so on. And again, it's a standard feature on reasonable scopes. So this seems to work okay. There's a few display options. One is to turn it between dot and uh, vector display. Um, it's not that easy to see the difference in, in practice which is the case with a lot of scopes um, on square waves it's probably a bit more obvious but I don't quite know why you'd ever really want dot mode persistence this is fairly unusual it's got persistence which is variable it's not a true unfortunately it's not a true intensity graded display like you get in things like the Agilent um, uh, and the Tektronix DPO scopes um, but there might be some situations where it might be useful you can set it to one two or five seconds or infinite and infinite you just have to turn it off to clear it XY mode, so if you like making lizard use figures and so on, you can do those. This determines the USB stick saving form, it'll either save a screen bitmap or it'll save basically the acquisition memory. Waveform save, again this is fairly standard stuff, um, you can say okay all right, channel 1 will save, th th there's um, four memory, so we say B, we save that into B and now we can display wave, waveform B which is there I've just saved it so maybe save another one in waveform C um, and you can show that so you can actually display in, uh, up to four waveforms and again that's fairly standard stuff just to save, save waveforms and, and overlay them here's something really unusual again uh, this is a feature that's only on the 1600 meg versions um, it's basically a way of recording multiple waveforms and then playing them back later if we set it record mode very confusingly stop go it actually says stop play so record mode play means it's running and I'll set this for manual trigger so I'll just give it a few random triggers it's giving a count there showing how many waveforms it's recorded I then um, stop that then go into playback what it will now do that's now replaying all those all those acquisitions that I just took I and mean, the only other time I've seen this on a scope is the segmented memory option on the Agilent ones and even that's quite uh, that's an expensive license option you can manually step through these as well it tell it whether you want to increase or decrease the direction and then just press it but you can step through the waveforms one by one um, so for something where you've got an intermittent problem where you want to leave something running um, acquiring data over a period this is potentially you know, very very useful a very unusual feature on a scope um, this cheap it's probably one feature that I could see myself using this on the bench instead of my um, Agilent for occasions where I need this particular feature right, just check the high frequency performance this is 30 megahertz 40 50 it's a little bit jittery uh, I'm not sure whether that's sample point jitter or just general trigger um, instability. It's again for a handheld scope. It's I think it's usable. 
Where are we? 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. So yeah, we've still got reasonable gain up 100 megs. 110, 120, 130. Yeah, it's starting to get a bit shaky, but we've still actually got a fairly readable waveform at 130 megahertz. 140, it's now starting to show aliasing quite badly. Um, 150, notice the frequency counters uh, not working anymore at this frequency. The frequency counter seems to top out at about 110 megahertz before it gives up and decides it can't measure anything, so that's certainly well within spec. Take a quick look at the power draw, just wider um, metering series with the battery. This is backlight full on in scope mode, um, about 700 milliamps. Take the backlight down, goes down to 600 milliamps. Um, if we turn a channel off, that also saves us about 50 milliamps or so. So it's a three and a half amp hour battery. So you're looking at about five hours battery life, which is pretty decent battery life for a portable instrument like this. Um, DMM mode goes down a bit, 480 with the backlight off, down to 390, 100 milliamps. So not great if it was just a multimeter, but for a scope, quite usable as long as you remember to charge it before you go out anywhere. Right, this button switches it between uh, multimeter and scope mode. Going out of DMM mode is a bit sluggish, it takes a couple of seconds, it's a bit annoying. But the first thing you notice is this pretty horrible looking analog display. And what's worse is it's just ridiculously slow. And the auto ranging is slow. The digital, meet, the, the digital side is about a factor of two to four slower than you'd want it to be. And the analog meter just, yeah, there's no point in having an analog meter if it's not fast. It's a complete waste of space. I sort of kind of wonder if that's the uh, the process that is actually having to generate this bitmap every time, which is why it's so slow. I just can't think why it should be so ridiculously slow. It's terrible, really, You've really got basic bad. functions, voltage, current, resistance, and within each function, this set button cycles through. So, for example, in voltage mode, it goes DC volts. Thinks about it, AC volts. Again ridiculously sluggish, I don't see why that's so slow. Resistance mode, again like like the old um, analog meters it actually has zero on the right, um, but again it's so slow it's just a complete waste of time. It's got diode test, but the diode test voltage only goes up to about one volt, it won't even light a red lead, it's ridiculous. And why they've got this negative part on diode test, it's just stupid. Um, continuity, they claim the continuity beeper goes at um, below 50 ohms. In practice it's more like about 20. It's reasonably quick. There's a slight delay on there. Um, but oddly, I think it's a very crude bit of circuitry because if you actually give it different resistances, the, over about between sort of 20 to 20, 25 ohms it gets quieter. So I think that's probably a really, really crude analog continuity um, thing on there. The only other controls you've got uh, manual or auto ranging, you've got still got backlight adjustment or you don't have the bar graph on there. Um, the delta mode, one sort of nice-ish thing is when you've got a delta to zero it does actually show you what the um, delta value is. Uh, it's also got capacitance, again it's as slow as slug sluggish as all the other ranges. Pretty sort of bog standard sort of capacitance performance you get out of a DMM, nothing uh, particularly exciting and for some reason the manual ranging doesn't seem to work at all in capacitance mode just doesn't do anything uh, about 10 puff resolution which I suppose might be just enough to do things like measure which end of a cable has gone open circuit but uh, as you'll see in the, tie the um, teardown it actually gets a lot worse than this to be honest you know it's a piece of shit I'm not even going to bother testing the accuracy they claim 1% and I don't really care whether it meets that or not it's just the multimeter is a heap of junk you know, I wish they hadn't even bothered including it and made it a smaller scope, you know, a smaller overall unit. If you're going to put a multimeter in, make it a reasonable one, otherwise just don't bother. It's just a complete waste of space. And when you put it in current mode, it gives you this warning about, there's no detection of the leads, but it gives you a warning to change the leads, which is probably more annoying than useful. The, the biggest problem is it's just too slow to be a decent meter. And as you see in the tear down, there's some uh, quite other significant issues. So. You know, if you're go going to buy this unit, just forget that it's got a multimeter. Treat it just as a scope, and make sure you you know you take a fluke or a or a decent meter with you. Piece of crap. I don't care what the accuracy is. I'm sure it's almost certainly going to be rubbish, but I'm just not going to use it. Okay, conclusions. Um, firstly, let's get the multimeter out of the way. It's a piece of crap. Um, the 
major problems are it's too slow and the 400 milliamp fuse is soldered in. Those really are the biggest problems. If they'd fix those, it would actually become a slightly more usable multimeter. I mean, an unfused 10 amp range, I don't have a major problem with, as long as it's clearly labeled as such. Um, accuracy isn't great, well, they play 1%, but again, not, all, not often a, a big deal, but it's just a shame that they, they ruined it for the sake of a few pennies. Um, so, if you're considering this, ignore the fact it's got a multimeter in it, just think of it as a scope. Um, so as a scope, good points. Well, you know, it's a nice size, it's a decent size, it's got a nice fast screen update, good battery life. So as a portable scope, you know, it's basically quite a nice unit. It's reasonable performance, um, 2060 and 100 meg version. Um, Cost-wise, the price on this varies quite a lot depending on where you, where you got it. I got this for £540 through eBay. I've seen it on one UK dealer at £600. I've seen it at another UK dealer for about £720. Um, so, shop around. Um, it's definitely a big improvement over the old model. Um, the improved user interface really makes a big difference to how usable it is. The backlight's also a lot better. So if you're thinking of buying one, definitely go for the new model. And uh, it, Maybe they'll discontinue these and they'll be available really cheap, but it really is worth the um, the extra for this, just in terms of usability. It makes quite a big difference. Um, things I don't like about it, uh, these vents in the top, so it's not very waterproof. Stupid choice of connectors, but again, it's not the sort of thing you use very often on a portable scope, so that's that's more of a, you know, a design engineer's annoyance than a um, practical usage point of view. Not particularly keen on these BNCs, but I think you know if, if the worst comes to worst you could probably replace them if they do disintegrate at some point. Um, scope performance, yes, yeah, there's a little bit of noise here and there, but you know you get you you do have compromises on a portable instrument. Um, but in terms of a you know this this is probably still about the best in terms of the amount of scope performance you get in for, for the size and weight. So if you just want the smallest Decent usable scope. I think you know, I've yet to see anything better to be honest. Um, there's the new uh, nano quad that looks quite interesting, but it's only a 72 meg sampling, so it's probably basically a 10 meg scope, um, which is really a bit limiting. Um, and the yeah, it's got I think it's a touch screen or menus and so on, so it's a lot fillier. So, but as a general usable scope, if you want a decent small usable scope, yeah, I think this is probably probably the one for you. Overall, I would say, again, completely forgetting the multimeter, I'd give it maybe 6.5 to 7 out of 10. If they a few little software tweaks, uh, a few more user interface improvements, things like pulse width trigger, I think it would go up to 7.5, maybe 8 out of 10 as a scope. You know, I'm happy with it, I'll, I'll carry on using it. As someone that designs products, there's a, things in here which I know could have been done better. Um, which I always find annoying on just about any product. Um, what's a little bit odd is that you know some of the lack of think, you know, thinking and um, sort of slight crapness in it. Contrast that with the fact that you know it's a fast update. It's got an FPGA in there. Someone clearly knew what they were doing when they designed a lot of this. So I'm guessing I don't know if maybe they've got one guy that's a real hot shot in the company. They did all the hard stuff and then put the multimeter functions to some idiot that doesn't really know what they're doing. I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, it's not a bad piece of kit, but could do a lot better.